thank you so much for joining us. Master Mitch, I don't want to take too much of your time because I know you've got some fascinating stuff for us. So I'm going to hand over to you. Please take it away. Thanks very much for the introduction, John. And I'd like to welcome you all today to today's presentation. I'm Mitch Reardon. And lately I've been doing quite a lot of radio, newspaper and magazine interviews to promote my new book, Shaping Addo, the story of a South African national park. One question that kept coming up was, what makes Addo special? There are of course a lot of things that make Addo special, but on top of my list is its biodiversity. So before taking a look at some interesting aspects of animal behavior that I encountered in Addo, I'd like to do a tour of the park to demonstrate what I mean. In 1931, when Addo Elephant National Park was proclaimed, it was only 2,270 hectare in size, smallest national park in Southern Africa. In the 1970s and 80s, it was expanded to an astonishing 182,000 hectares, 130 times bigger than its original size. It's now the third largest national park in South Africa after Kruger and Falagadi and one of the most biodiverse protected spaces in the planet. Okay, next picture. Belinda. Belinda. Okay. All right, Darlington. Uh, so, tour begins in the far north of Addo. No, we've got to go back. We've gone just, okay. Yeah. Um, Tour begins in the far north of Addo in the Darlington area, which takes its name from Darlington Dam, which you see here. Addo has five of South Africa's seven biomes. Biome is a distinct botanical community. And here, the semi-arid Namakaru is one of them, okay? Darlington has been stocked with typical Namakaru species, such as black wildebeest. This herd is grazing on freshly sprouting grass on the dam's floodplain. Behind them are the foothills of the Zierberg Mountains, and behind them, the Zierberg itself. This extreme eastern outlier of the Cape Fold Mountains stretches all the way from the Cedarberg, 800 kilometers to the west. It blocks rainfall from Addo's coastal plains and is the reason the Namakaru is so dry. Okay. Right. So Cape Mountain zebras also have been reintroduced to Darlington and are doing well. So these euphorbias that you see growing in front of the zebras are called Nuas. They're endemic to this region, which is known as the Nuas Felt. Okay. Right. Okay, a couple of male lions have been released into Darlington and they have made their home in the lowlands that has typical Karoo looking country. All right, next one. Right, this is the Zierberg mountain range seen from the austere Karoo side of the range. It's dry, tough country. Springboks have prospered here, and although it's a little known fact, Addo has the second largest springbok population in the country. Although you won't see a single one when you go down to uh, the southern tourist area. Okay. Right, a massive eland bull accompanied by a cattle egret near the summit of the Zierberg. It's here that we encounter Addo's second biome, Feinbos. It's a high altitude leftover from an earlier ice age. I drove the four wheel drive Bedrochfontein trail that goes over the Zierberg and into Southern Addo. This somewhat challenging 45 kilometer track is open to the public for anyone looking for a bit of adventure. Okay. Right, this is an arena on the southwestern side of the Zierberg. Very different to Darlington's rain shadow aspect. That's because this side of the Zierbeck gets twice the rainfall. And forest is Addo's third biome. 
And the pink that you can see in places like this um, is in the forest canopy are flowering Cape chestnuts. Okay. All right. Um, these forests hold one of the biggest populations of South Africa's smallest antelope, the elusive blue diker. Plentiful population of the range restricted tree hyrax also occurs here. All right. All right, this is a Nyati rest camp on the southeastern side. This is on the eastern southern side of the Ziober. Here we encounter thicket, Addo's fourth biome, known as Speckboom Felt. Um, many would say this is Addo's most typical biome. Beyond Arena and Inyati's rest camps lies true wilderness. The entrance roads do not go any further. Okay. A family group of elephants almost disappears into the speckworm woodland. Buffaloes and rhinos do disappear altogether. These thorny thickets are extremely hostile to humans on foot. I recommend that you walk the PPC Discovery Trail in main camp next time you visit Addo and imagine stepping off the trail into the tangle of vegetation threaded through with flesh tearing spiny plants with names like needlebush, catthorn, boxthorn, kraal spikethorn, and beasting bush. Okay. So for much of the year, the spectrum looks fairly anonymous, but after six generous rainfall, it shows off with a glorious burst of flowers. This is the candelabra also known as Brunsvigia, okay? And this is the petal of the Karua Burbin, all right? The bright yellow Karu rigosum, or wild pomegranate, okay? And this is a spectacular lavender star, species of Gruya, all right? Pink oxalis. So if you're in Addo when it rains or after it's rain, you can expect to see all of these flowers. They're amazing. And finally, onto the ubiquitous plumbago, which threads itself through um, the, uh, the spectrum wherever it grows. All right. So these red hearted beasts are grazing in what is commonly known as Bornfelt. That's, that's the Bornfeld there in front, and these clumps are pretty typical of Bornfeld. This is Addo's only indigenous, indigenous grassland, and grassland is Addo's fifth biome. Bornfeld is always surrounded by thicket, okay? This is one of Addo's most famous residents. It's the flightless dung beetle. Of South Africa's approximately 800 dung beetle species, there is only one flightless dung beetle, and that is found exclusively in and around Addo. Okay. These plain zebra, so these are plain zebra, not mountain zebras, are grazing on Addo Heights. That's in the middle of, um, of Addo. And this open grassland is in fact artificial. Before this section was included in the park, going, this is going back quite a long way, the original speckworm thicket was cut down for wood to fuel brick kilns in the growing city of Port Elizabeth. Grass took its place, but these shrubs show that thicket is slowly returning. Okay. This coalition of two male lions are on another artificial grasslands, this one in the lowlands of the southern Colchester section. These grasslands came about when this was farmland and cleared originally for crops, but when poor rainfall defeated that endeavor, they were converted to pastures. This picture 
demonstrates another Addo speciality. It is one of only two parks in Africa that I know of where visitors can view lions with the ocean in the background. Okay. So these grassy plains support groups of meerkats. Being out in the open means having to keep a constant eye out for raptors above and jackals below. All right. Okay. And these grasslands also support bat-eared foxes. Here, father babysits two pups at the entrance to their burrow. Now, Addo also, okay, go on. Addo also includes Woody Cape and around 65 kilometers of the Indian Ocean shoreline within its discontinuous borders. So when you go from Colchester in the main section, you actually leave the park, cross the N2, the N into Colchester Village, and then you drive down and you rejoin the park um, in the Woody Cape section. So in this picture, we've got bottlenose dolphins surfing the breakers against the backdrop of the Alexandria dunes which rise up to 600 meters in places. Okay. So Alexandra's fine grained hills of loose golden sand form the biggest and least degraded dune field in the Southern hemisphere. So these things I'm mentioning, these are all specialities of Addo as well. Okay, next one. Uh, these are rangers, sand parks rangers, on patrol in the interdune section of the Alexandra Dunes. And these white patches that you can see in front of the vehicle are remnants of shell middens left either by sun or bushmen, hunter gatherers, up to 5,000 years ago, or if they contain pieces of pottery, which the bushmen didn't have, by koi pastoralists or ku pastoralists up to 2000 years ago. All right. All right. Um, Addo also protects the high conservation status bird and St. Croix Island groups in Algoa Bay. These days, bird and St. Croix protect around 10,000 endangered African penguins. And African penguins, by the way, are the most endangered species in Addo. They're more endangered than rhinos. And they, this particular population is now the largest African penguin population in the world. In the background, Cape gannets, you see them flying there, um, fly by Bird's famous lighthouse, manned since 1852. The photographer is Lloyd Edwards, who runs highly recommended tours of Algoa Bay. Okay. So a bonded pair of Cape gannets, Sky Point is part of an elaborate greeting ritual. Bird Island provides sanctuary to this immense breeding colony of nearly 200,000 Cape gannets. And that's another world speciality, if you like. This is the biggest Cape gannet breeding colony in the world. Okay. Okay, here's a Cape gannet busy eating an anchovy, currently overfishing of anchovies and sardines by commercial Persane fishing boats represents the greatest threat to Addo's gannet and penguin populations. There's not enough fish to go around once the commercial fishermen are done. All right. This is a roseate tern. It's diving for small schooling fish. Bird Island is the only place of Southern Africa where these, ele these elegant birds regularly breed. All right. And a humpback whale breaches off Woody Cape. Humpback, humpbacks migrate via Algo Bay to their East African breeding grounds in June, July, and return from November to early January. All right. So here, um, visitors admire a great white shark during a raggy charters tour. Addo is celebrated as the home of the big seven because it not only conserves the usual big five, elephant, rhino, buffalo, 
lion and leopard, but also the great white shark and southern right whale. Okay. And close to Bird Island, Black Rocks is home to around 4,000 Cape fur seals, the most easterly population of fur seals in Africa. Okay, and so that brings us to the end of our look at the um, biodiversity. And we now go on to the beastly behavior side. Josie, the fierce lioness, is one of the best known characters in Addo. And one of the interesting things about Addo lions is their very curious social system, um, which they share with other parks with small lion populations. Unlike Kruger and Serengeti, where lions have a pride-based social system, in Addo, there is a more tenuous association between the sexes, okay? Females like Josie don't feel the need for male guardians. Instead, they live apart with their cubs, including sub-adult females who remain with their mother after she again gives birth. Adult males form coalitions, usually of two, and only join a female when she's an estrus. Okay. All right. Cub, cub grooming, however, is standard practice among all lion societies. We put these pictures in because lion cub pictures are cute. Everybody loves them. Lion tongues have abrasive lumps that dig deep to remove skin irritants. This type of social grooming dislodges more parasites than self-grooming because the groomer licks against the grains of the fur, whereas self-groomers lick along the lay of their own fur. All right. And one more cute lion cub picture. Social playing is not the sole domain of young cubs only. Lions maintain their playful nature into maturity and it's not unusual to see grown-up cubs chasing, biting, and jumping on each other. These cubs are only, uh, they're still young. They're about three months old here. Next picture. <clears throat> All right, this is Josie and the cubs on a warthog kill, although the cubs are only just learning to eat meat, and these two on the left would rather play than eat. Um, Josie specializes in hunting warthogs, and quite often she'll dig them out of their burrows. Okay. All right. However, buffaloes bear the brunt of lion predation. When visiting Addo after a particularly harsh drought, I was astonished by the number of buffalo kills I saw just by driving the tourist roads. Buffaloes quickly lose condition during a drought and lions are quick to take advantage. By the end of this drought, Addo had lost half of its buffaloes to lion predation. Okay. Buffalo calves are particularly vulnerable. It's been about 150 years since the last lion was shot in this region. And buffaloes at first did not know how to respond to lion attacks other than by stampeding. Often calves got left behind when taken. But in time, they either learned or simply reverted to age-old DNA-inspired defense mechanisms. Instead of fleeing, the buffaloes joined together in large herds and the adults protected the calves by confronting the lions. Okay. At night, they kept out of the thickets, thickets where lions could stalk them and instead gathered on the open plains, the better to defend themselves. So here's a group of old bulls. They settling down into a protective huddle or circle, heads and horns facing outwards, and they will spend the night chewing the cud and intermittently sleeping lightly to avoid a rude awakening. Okay. All right. So this breeding herd of buffaloes adopts another safety stratagem. On their way to a waterhole, they follow a tourist road, not necessarily to make the journey easier, but because the open road slightly improves their chances of detecting lions that might be waiting an ambush. But during the drought, the starving herds broke apart 
to seek grazing wherever they could find it, even in the thickets and even at night. Finally, management decided to translocate half of Addo's lion population to other place, to other parks and place the remaining females on birth control to give the buffalo population a chance to recover. Okay. All right. Now, this sequence of pictures illustrates a not so typical day in the social life of the Inyati lions. So if you want to see these lions, you have to go into the Inyati section. As I mentioned, males form coalitions, usually of two. And this is the Anyati male coalition. Used to be the best of friends, okay? Right, a lioness needing her two two-month-old cubs roars softly to tell the males that she is approaching. She wants to introduce the cubs to their fathers so they will recognize them as their offspring and not instinctively kill them as strange invading males would, okay? All right, so the, the mother lioness carefully watches the dominant male as he playfully cuffs one of the cubs, all right? <clears throat> First, the cubs are frightened and they run away from the male. Next, uh, okay. However, their mother reassures them that all is safe, okay? And eventually the four settle as a group, okay? But the lioness wants the other male to meet her cubs and she leads them towards him, all right? Subordinate male responds with a fleming grimace, as if the female is an estrus, which she definitely is not. Okay. Right, the dominant male is highly offended by his companion's response and rakes the ground with his back feet in a territorial marking behavior, all the while glaring at his old friend. Okay. Then he sent marks by rubbing his face uh, or the cheek glands on his face on this bush. All right. Okay. Right. And then he sent marks by spraying a musk smelling mix of urine and secretions from two anal glands near the base of his tail onto the same bush, which is just another way of marking territory. So nobody should mistake whose territory this belongs to. All right. He then trots towards the subordinate male, roaring aggressively, okay. Subordinate male watches his erstwhile companion bearing down on him with a horrified look on his face, all right. Then he turns, turns tail and runs for his life. I caught up with these two males a couple of days later and they still hadn't rejoined. So somebody's feelings got hurt badly, okay. All right, elephants are also intriguing animals to watch. So before looking at aspects of their behavior, I'm gonna point out that what sets Addo's elephants apart from those elsewhere is the extraordinarily high rate of tusklessness among cows. Males do have tusks. A 2002 study found that 98% of females were tuskless. This is the result of historic selective hunting for ivory compounded by Addo's very small founder herd. It was only 11 elephants. That was, the, that was the original size of the herd. It's now over 650. And they pass their inherited tuskless gene to later generations, okay? All right. In order to broaden the gene, gene pool, and hopefully ameliorate the tuskless gene. No, go back. 
That's it. Uh, four Kruger bulls, including this one, known as Valley, were translocated to Addo in 2002. This picture shows Valley in full must, a sexually active state that includes a dribble of urine down his hind legs and a seep of sappy secretions that flow from his temporal glands. Okay. Right, so waterholes are important in elephant, um, in elephant activities, and they often adopt a very proprietary attitude towards other species at waterholes. This one squirts a trunk full of water into the face of a warthog that is dared to approach too close. Okay. And just for fun, this young bull decided to test the photographer's sense of humor by squirting him with water. I'm pleased to report that I did see the funny side. Okay. At the height of severe droughts, elephant mass around Hapua Dam, that's Hapua over there, um, which has the deepest and least stagnant water. Instead of drinking and leaving, family groups gather into huge kinship groups that take um, you can move on to the next one, that take quiet pleasure in each other's company. The adults commune in silence, but the ever irrepressible calves take the opportunity to play or simply flop on top of each other. Okay. So these are elephant bulls at a waterhole and they usually do all their waterhole activity apart from the female and calf breeding herds. And it's been noticed that when one bull arrives at a waterhole, it isn't long before other bulls also turn up. Uh, evidently, they, it's thought that they communicate this intention, perhaps by using low frequency rumbles that we can't hear. Males en enjoy each other's company as much as family groups do, but they do so much more boisterously, okay? All right, tactile communication, that is touching between elephants is fascinating to watch. The elephant equivalent of shaking hands is putting the tip of your trunk into a friend's mouth. So they've obviously not uh, met for a while and he's saying, hi mate, great to see you again. Okay. Then the fun begins, splashing, friendly wrestling, diving under the water using the tip of the trunk as a snorkel, okay? And here a shy calf watches the big boys play from behind her mother's bulk, all right? The few Artificial water holes in Colchester, they're not many, um, have a weak water flow, and some have an electrified elephant exclusion fence around them to allow lesser species to drink without being chased away by elephants. However, certain young bulls have learned to detect when the current is off, and also how to climb through or under a fence when the power is down. And these young bulls love load shedding. Okay. All right, now the serious side to elephants hogging waterholes is contained in this remote camera picture taken, captured of these two bloody black rhino bulls contesting rights to a nearby waterhole. Rangers believe one bull challenged the other while seeking a new place to drink after elephants monopolized his regular waterhole. That's why park management tries to rest restrict elephant access to certain water holes. Okay. Now for a quick look at kudu social life. These young bulls spar by pushing and wrestling in a low intensity test of strength. 
they they don't they're not out to hurt each other. It's just a pushing match, and one realizes before too long that he's outmatched. And this establishes an individual male's place in the bull hierarchy for life, which helps avoid more aggressive battles later in life. Okay. So when they need a breather, they pretend to have seen some danger and they look up, but actually it's just another display. All right. So once the hierarchy, once your status, once the bull status has been established in the male hierarchy, dominant bulls actually do tolerate subordinates in, in, in close to them, even during the mating season, as long as they perform what is called appeasement behavior. And here we have a great um, example of that. So this subordinate bull tucks his tail firmly between his legs, lowers his head, and avoids meeting the gaze of the dominant male who checks him out, is satisfied by his appeasement behavior, and just goes on walking. Okay. During the, the rut, during the mating season, a bull checks every female he meets to test her sexual readiness. Okay. All right. And he does so by nudging her bladder with his nose, which prompts her to urinate. And then he sniffs or drinks some of the urine, which will tell him if she is an estrus. He does that Fleming that we had a look at the lion doing, and he is able to uh, detect certain chemicals, which will tell him the state of her uh, sexual readiness. Okay. Now, the red hartebeest rut, on the other hand, is far more fiercely contested. Only bulls that hold territory will mate. So possession of a good territory is crucial. And this powerful territory holder adopts the proud stance, tail, and head raised, he's standing on slightly elevated land, and this is all to intimidate potential rivals. All right. If there is a challenge, it's always accepted, and then the bulls drop to their knees and butt against their opponent's horns. Okay. So twisting his horns, the more powerful of the two forces his opponent's head to one side and throws him off balance. All right. Having lost balance, the loser breaks off and flees, closely pursued by the victor. Okay. The weaker contender is often chased a long way by the winner. All right. And during the madness of the chase, this kudu gets caught up in the excitement. All right. One morning on the Ambachi grasslands in the Colchester section, I witnessed an intriguing interaction between an eland nursery herd and a small herd of bachelor plain zebras. When the zebra noticed a very young Elon calf, one of them approached with intense curiosity. Okay. Next moment, the calf took fright and bolted. And immediately, three of the stallions went after it in hot pursuit. Incredibly, the calf's mother uh, passively stood by, watching without trying to intervene. Okay. Finally exhausted, the calf dropped to the ground and lay very still. Stallion walked over and sniffed it. And then all three zebras lost interest. Okay. With the threat over, the mother Elan retrieved her calf and the two quietly walked away. Although this behavior is still a mystery, it has been seen often enough in other parts of Southern and East Africa to attract the attention of field biologists. We don't have time now to go into all their fascinating theories as to why this should happen. And that's 
uh, zebras chasing not only elon calves, but also uh, wildebeest calves, and also Thunisbach that he'd seen to chase. And even Thompson's gazelle in East Africa, babies. So if you want to find out why this happens, you'll have to read the book. And that brings us to the end of the show, okay? And now if there are any questions, I think John will read them out. Mr. Mitch. Yeah, um, yes, John. <laughs> my goodness. Um, you have- you anything. <laughs> you have such amazing pictures. It's like, as you are, as you are, telling the story, I can, I can see myself there and I can see myself um, just enjoying the beautiful scenery that you've, that you've got captured here. I think this is absolutely amazing. Um, it just makes us, uh, uh, in fact, myself and everybody else on the call today, just feel like how privileged we are to live in such a beautiful country with such beautiful scenery. Well done, well done, well done. Thank um, you. And we really? are privileged, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely, and uh, I'm gonna start with a basic question because we've got, on the call today, we've got um, our regulars all the way from Scotland, from, I mean, we've, we've got a whole pool of, 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 um, of visitors on the call today. So all the pictures that you took here, are they all from South Africa? And just uh, take us quickly in terms of geographical location, where exactly they are in South Africa. No, they're not only in South Africa, they're all in Addo. So all the pictures that we saw this morning are taken in Addo Elephant National Park. Different sections of it, but they are all, that's, that's what makes Addo so amazing because it has this incredible biodiversity. You know how they, you may have heard the, the comment that um, Africa is the whole world in one country. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's part of our tourism advertising. I like to say that Addo is the whole of South Africa in one country. My goodness. This is, this is, oh. And, um, and, and what if, do you, um, as you're taking these photographs, if they, there's this, you know, taking all these scenic photographic pictures of all these beautiful animals, do you know exactly what, you looking for, or is it by chance? Um, look, I do come across situations by chance, but I, you have, if you're going to do animal behavior, you have to know a lot about mm. animal behavior, because I can see situations developing, or I can see something happening, and I know immediately this is interesting. I should, I should stick around and see how things develop. So um, I cannot stress importantly enough. People say to me, "Where you know you're lucky to get these pictures. Luck's got nothing to do with it. It's mm. it, it's it's knowing your subject and waiting for the situation to develop and know just how it may develop. So if I'm hunting, if I'm if I'm photographing, let's say a cheetah. Well, we don't have cheetahs in Adu, but let's say a lion stalking a hartebeest." Uh, beast." I know more or less where to position myself to get into room so that when it comes, the harder beast runs my way and I can photograph it all. So knowing those sort of things is absolutely crucial. Sure. I've got tons of questions, but before I ask my questions, let me jump on to the call and check out the Q&A. Uh, we've got lots of questions, so um, I'm hoping that you're going to brace yourself for all of this. And um, just for everybody's um, uh, information, what we will try and do is we'll try and collate some of the questions that we might not be able to answer today and um, collate them. And our team from Straight Nature, Belinda and the team, will be able to compile and then send them individually to, to you all, or um, especially ask um, uh, Mr. Mitch to comment on them and then perhaps maybe get back to you a little bit later. Uh, but without any waste of time, Lindsay um, is asking, was there tuskless uh, gene in elephants an abnormality? Or was it a natural development because of the hunting of tusks? Exactly. It was the last one. So what happened was that people would come into an area and they would shoot out the elephants with the biggest tusks first. And then once they had gone, they would start shooting the elephants with the smaller tusks. 
they didn't bother shooting out the elephants with no tusks. So those were the ones that survived. And obviously they passed on that genetic characteristic to their babies who passed it on to their babies. So to try and bring tusks back, they introduced those elephant bulls who are all big tuskers. And I must say that it's working. Um, so that calves born now, where once upon a time they almost definitely would be tuskless, now 20% of calves born do have tusks. Female calves do have, have tusks. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's crazy how, how this, all of this happened. Um, Penny is asking us, um, is the survival rate of lion cubs in Ido higher than normal? You know, it could be, yes, because um, in most, like a big park like the Kruger National Park, any cub that's born in the Kruger has only a 50% chance of surviving to adulthood. So, uh, whereas in Addo, they would all survive. So normally a, a, a lioness in, in Addo would have probably as many cubs as a Kruger lioness, two, three, around that number, but all her cubs will survive almost all of them anyway, unless something happens to mother, which shouldn't. So they found that the lion population grows very quickly in, in Addo. And so there has to be management. They have to come in and just take out some of them every now and again. Otherwise they have an unnatural impact on the prey populations, particularly buffaloes. Mm. Um, let me just take two questions also. Um, the first one, are the open areas in Addo a natural occurrence or a result of farming? Um, that's the one from Denise. And um, Roger's asking, when did the Addo Elephant Park expand and change um, the Addo National to, to the Addo National Park? Okay, so um, the on the mainland, so here I'm not talking about Algoa Bay and Woody Cape, on the mainland, they basically bought up, it's, it's, it's very tough country around Addo. And what you had were farms all around Addo, but they were essentially subsistence farms. People were struggling to make a living. So when they got a good offer from the government to buy up their farm, they accepted it. So all these farms were included uh, into Addo. So going back to the first question, are the grasslands natural or artificial? If you're in the, what we call the main tourist area, which is around mm -hmm. the, the main camp and, mm -hmm. uh, and further south in Colchester, all the grasslands that you see there are in fact artificial. They are the, 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 the thicket was either cut down um, to put into kilns, to make bricks, to make fires, to make bricks, or they were cleared. So originally to, to grow crops, but the crops didn't work out because the rain was just too unpredictable. So they switched to small stock farming. So all those grasslands that you see basically in Addo, in the Southern section where most of the tourists go are, are artificial. But that doesn't mean that they're not good. I mean, the grass is perfect. And you, you probably see a lot more animals on the grasslands than you do in the, in the thickets because uh, that's very good grass growing there. Sure. This is, uh, I mean, we've got so many questions, uh, but I think um, for the sake of time, uh, I think we still have a uh, good time with us uh, and we still have everybody on the call. Um, Lynn says, thank you so much for this amazing presentation with so many people and also saying, thank you so much. You are absolutely amazing. Everybody says your voice is just so amazing. <laughs> and I think on this cold winter day, we could just sit all and cuddle up in a blanket and just watch your beautiful pictures and just listen to you speak. Um, so, thank you for um, the kind words. Um, tell, <laughs> tell the folks thanks for the kind words. <laughs> no, they're all listening. And I'm sure everybody's going to just be wanting for your, for your contact details. And Belinda, so gear yourself up for, for just linking us with Mitch on, on Facebook. Um, um, Sherry, Sherry, I think is asking a very similar question, which was asked a little bit earlier on. It says, apart from the females in, um, in the founding head of elephants being tuskless, were they also smaller than elephants in the other parts of Southern Africa? No, and that's, a, that's an interesting question because mm. it was a rumor and everybody believed it, including myself. I thought that they were smaller as well. 
And I was talking to the head ranger down there and I just mentioned, you know, the small Addo elephants. And he said, he said, that's not true. They're not smaller. They weigh the same as the Kruger elephants. He said, we know because we've weighed them. And when they capture animals now, our elephants, they, they lift them up on these enormous cranes and put them on the back of a truck. And then they put them into a special holding pen. And when they lift them from the ground to put them onto the truck, they weigh them. And elephants and Adu weigh exactly the same as elephants and Kruger. Wow. Um, I love this particular question from Clive. Um, Clive is asking a question that I want to know about. Um, he says, um, is one allowed to go on the islands? <laughs> no. I think it's quite no. adventurous. <laughs> no, you're not allowed to go on the islands. Um, there has been talk about opening them to... To, to tourists, but it hasn't been done yet. And it's a very sensitive area. Um, the birds like the penguins and the gannets have become habituated to people. And I think that you could take groups onto the island as long as you had a guide with them and who'd say, right, you can't go here or you can go there, or they've got a nest over here, don't go too close. But that hasn't come yet. So all you can do is, um, get one of these raggy charters who is run by Lloyd Edwards. Um, and he takes you out on the boat, but you can't leave the boat, but you'll definitely see penguins fishing and you'll definitely see gannets and you can go close to the island. You just can't get off the boat. Get off the boat. Oh, I see, I see. And um, some questions also about um, individuals that have been to Ido, uh, but unable to spot lions. Um, is there a particular way of knowing how to spot the lions or? What's your take on that? There is. There is a, a particular way to spot the lions. Just keep going back and back and back, and eventually you'll spot them. <laughs> no, actually, um, I must say I was lucky in a way. When I was doing work there, there were twice as many lions as there are now. Um, mm. And that whole sequence with the um, – that was just pure luck. I didn't expect it at all. That whole sequence with the lioness bringing her cubs in and the dominant male getting angry and chasing his friend away – that was pure luck. I just came in, saw the two males, stopped, turned off the engine. And then I heard this distant, soft roaring. And I knew that the lioness was due to have cubs. In fact, they said she probably has had cubs, but nobody had seen them. And I heard this soft moaning and I stayed. I must say I was also using a, a very big telephoto lens. They weren't that close to me. Uh, it looks like they're right next to me. But in fact, I was using a thousand millimeter telephoto lens to pull them in. Awesome stuff. Um, uh, to everybody that's still on the call, we've got um, just a few more minutes uh, before 11.30. So we've got five more minutes. So I'll take a couple of more questions because there's just so many cool questions coming up. And, um, and, and, and besides the questions, we just love listening to your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Nathan um, is asking um, uh, quite an interesting question. He says a male a uh, lion named Sylvia was translocated from Kruger National Park to Edo. Um, do you know how this lion has integrated uh, with the lioness at, at, at Edo? And um, many thanks for this fascinating talk. And I think it's more about, you know, just relocating, translocating animals from one park to the other. How do they normally behave? Um, do they transition easy? Yeah, so the whole idea is so that you don't get, um, you know, so, so that you have different males and females getting together and you don't get this very limited gene pool. It is difficult. Um, for instance, they took out two of the regular males in Addo and took them to Mountain Zebra National Park, which is near Craddock. And they brought in another two males that had never been seen in the area before. And we had another lioness called Adlam, and she had two um, sub-adult cubs, one a male and one a female. And when these new dominant males arrived in Addo, um, they immediately objected to this, to her uh, sort of sub-adult male cub. And they tried to attack him and chase him away. And she intervened to try and protect him. And she got bitten badly on the back. And um, her, her, uh, the, the bite, the wound became infected and poor old Adlam, she was old, she was about 14 at the time, uh, which is old for a lion, 
um, had to be euthanized. So there is a danger of something like that happening, but you have to do it. Otherwise, you know, the gene pool just um, doesn't become sufficiently broad. Broad, oh, I see. Let me take three questions because um, they may be closely related to one another. Um, from Errol, he says, um, have cheetahs never occurred naturally in the Edo area? Uh, what happened uh, to the two that escaped from the local reserve? That's the first one. Um, Kate uh, is asking, returning to the lion population with Ado, um, what, what, is, what is your thought, to, what is thought to be the reason uh, for the high cup survival rate in Ado versus Kruger, for example? And um, again, thank you for the wonderful talk. And one last question from my side. Is it common? <laughs> And this is just purely out of ignorance, and I apologize for asking this question. How is it? Is it quite a normal thing for the lioness to be single mothers? Or because I found that so fascinating that it was just, you know, she wants to be alone with her calves and no, uh, no male lion. <laughs> Go yeah, well, uh, the reason that she does that is because she can, because there are no lions to, there are other males. So in a place like Kruger, Every pride has its own territory. Um, and the job of the males is to keep other males out. Um, because if they do get in, if they chase out the pride males, the first thing they do is kill the cubs because they don't want to raise another male's cubs. And by killing the cubs, that brings the lionesses into estrus. So they're ready to mate again. Then they mate with them. And then they know that these cubs are our cubs. So the point of life on earth here basically is to pass on DNA. People say, well, isn't it cruel that these males should kill the cubs? It's not cruel. It's absolutely instinctive. Um, they do it because that's what they're trained. That's what they are born to do, essentially. Now, you don't have that situation in Addo because there just aren't any other lions around. So uh, you don't, uh, the lionesses don't need to have males to protect their cubs. Um, they can do it themselves, and, and they do. And they don't want males around because when they make a kill, the males chase them off and steal their kill. But if the males make a kill, they won't let the female come underneath. They chase her away. So there's really no percentage in the lioness having males except when she comes into heat or when she comes into estrus and she's ready to mate. Then she goes and looks for them. Yeah, and, and regarding the, just the survival rate uh, between Kruger and Ado, um, is there a particular significance of why that happens? Why there's more survival rate in Ado versus Kruger? Well, because a lot of cubs get killed by, by oh. so when, when you've got two pride males and they start getting old, they're only pride males longest for five years. Uh, at, at the end of five years, they're up 12 years old, and then you get a couple of uh, young comes, uh, young males come in and they just chase the, uh, the old boys out or kill them. And then once they kill them, they kill the cubs. So all the cubs in that pride will get killed if these guys take mm -hmm. over. So in the old days, they used to say, well, the males don't do much. Yes, they do. They protect the pride. That's a really important job. So that's why you have such a high cub mortality rate in Kruger, whereas in Addo, it's almost... 100%, all the cubs survive to adulthood. Wow. And on the Ladies question of the cheetah, on the last, the question of the cheetah, those cheetahs came yes. in from outside of Addo um, and they were doing very well. So there's no reason why you probably couldn't have cheetah in Addo today. They just didn't want them. Um, so they captured them and they took them off to another game reserve in KwaZulu Natal. Wow. All right, I'm gonna take one last question from Dominique. Uh, Dominic Fuyun, who says, when it comes to studying animal behavior, do you have a course or people to talk uh, to, talk to uh, when you recommend? Uh, I'm hoping to do my PhD on it, uh, just animal behavior. Well, um, okay, animal behavior, the scientific name for it is ethology. So you start off at uh, university doing a BSc, probably doing um, they've got all kinds of degrees now that you can do. Um, animal behavior, so you, you, you decide to become a biologist or a zoologist, um, whatever the case may be. Um, and then you decide to become 
a field biologist. And that means that you go into the field and you study a particular, like happened with the lions in the Kruger. So they released the lions, but they wanted to find out exactly what they were doing, what they were hunting. And they had students come in and do various kinds of uh, tests. Um, so if you're doing a PhD, that's, that's, you're a long way down the trail. That's your doctorate. So, um, yeah, you're a specialist by that time. Wow. Um, so I, I, I love the way you answered that question because if it were me and I was in your position, I would have said, yeah, um, I usually charge a flat rate um, just to give advice on animal behavior. <laughs> <laughs> And, and what I'm going to ask Dominic to do is definitely reach out to you because of, I think you are one of the most um, um, important person that can definitely guide her on, on her vision of, of learning more about, you know, animal behavior because of you've just, you know, you've demonstrated it all and there's no better place to start. So Dominic, please make sure you reach out to Mr. Mitch um, and get some advice and, and you can take that offline. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd, I'd, I'd also just recommend to Dominique that you get Shaving Kruger and Shaping Addo because what I do in there is to quote a lot of scientific research and she can see exactly how all this behavior is worked out. Oh, awesome. In fact, you took the words out of my mouth. Um, we've got three fantastic books um, that are out um, and available for, for, for everyone to, to just see and learn from in fact we're giving away 15 percent discount um for the next coming two weeks uh, until the next wednesday talk shaping at all which is what we've been talking about um for this great presentation shaping kruger and we've got wild kruger as well so ladies and gentlemen please make sure you go out uh, reach out uh, check out the strict nature uh, website as well as the kisten bosch uh, book shop uh, and all those books will be available for you and um, we are also able to ship the books anywhere in the world. Um, so if you're out in Scotland, uh, out in Europe somewhere, or out in the US, uh, we can definitely hook you up as well. So please make sure to, to reach out. Um, and I'm going to just give you this last parting way, um, uh, something to leave us with. Um, what can you say to all of us that's been on the call today, Mr. Mitch? I would say I really enjoyed giving the talk. I really enjoyed your company. And who knows, maybe we'll meet somewhere in Addo again one day. Ah, <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely. Ladies and gentlemen, this particular recording and talk will be available on Facebook, both at the Kistenbosch National Botanical Facebook page, as well as the Straight Nature Club Facebook page. So please go on and like our Facebook pages. Uh, we'll also try and actually get Room to Grow's Facebook page uh, so that we can also post this amazing uh, talks. Um, from my side, uh, I want to thank everybody that's just joined us uh, from all over. Please remember to stay safe. Remember to wear your mask, keep a social distancing and um, sanitize. And when we get an opportunity, let's just all go and get ourselves vaccinated so that we can protect ourselves from this COVID-19. Uh, from the Straight Nature team, Belinda and the team working at the background, working on all the logistics. Thank you so much. We love you. We love you. We love you. And uh, to Kathy Edward that puts away, uh, that puts together all of these amazing talks. Thank you, Kathy. Mwah! We absolutely love the work that you do. And to you, Mr. Mitch, you are a blessing to all of us. Thank you for sharing the wonderful pictures and the wonderful presentation that you've just done. The pictures look absolutely amazing. And and I just, I think all of us here, we just want all those features, but we know where to get them because we can get them directly from your books. So we'll be making sure to get your books and, um, and keeping a piece of you with us in our homes. So from me to everybody, thank you very much. Until we meet again, uh, see you guys um, in two weeks time. Thank you so much, guys. Mr. Mitch, well done, well done, well done. See you soon. Thanks, John. I'll see you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Well, Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Thank you guys.